for Applications International Corporation. He was the first editor of the Journal of Geophysical Research, Planets, and a member of the imaging team for the Galileo mission to Jupiter and the near-Earth rendezvous mission to Eros. And um, his talk is uh, Asteroids, Comets, and the Environment. <laughs> the top one. And you will have to use this for the, the audience. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I guess this is not quite the right place. That's where I went first. But I'm a, another person who flew in from Colorado. I guess a lot of people were in Colorado yesterday. But I'm uh, from Colorado. I'd like to talk about asteroids, comets, and the environment. And I'm going to uh, concentrate on a couple of things. After a brief introduction, I, I want to give a primer on the impact hazard of comets and asteroids hitting the Earth, uh, but David Morrison is going to amplify a lot on some topics that I don't, uh, that I won't be touching in my primer. And then I want to get into uh, contrasting uh, asteroid impacts as an environmental disaster with uh, climate change as a, as a disaster, and concentrating especially on the rapidity of change, which I think is a very fundamental thing as we think about the environment. And finally, I'm going to wrap up with a few comments on uh, preserving asteroids and comets for future generations. Asteroids and comets are remnants from the origin of the solar system. They're the planetesimals that form the uh, inner planets and the cores of the outer planets and were left over when uh, the planets uh, formed. Um, so this is a little diagram of the solar system with the sun in the middle. This uh, greenish yellow donut is the you know, main asteroid belt. Here's Jupiter's orbit here. Uh, we sit in here. The red dots are actually uh, near-Earth asteroids. Comets, which come into this reg uh, region, um, come from far, far away. But comets and asteroids are actually rather similar things. It's just that comets have a little more volatiles uh, near their surfaces and form these uh, tails and so on. Now these small bodies in the solar system have affected our environment uh, for uh, ever since the beginning, and they will continue to do so in the future. To uh, uncertain degrees, they are, were the sources of, uh, of water and organic molecules on, on Earth. Uh, some hundreds of millions of years after the uh, formation of our planet, there was a bombardment, a blizzard, the, called the Late Heavy Bombardment, around uh, 3.9 billion years ago, that um, was discovered by the, uh, the Apollo samples. Um, but certainly, if, it hit, if things hit the moon, they at least hit the Earth, and uh, they were very huge impacts, and probably whatever origin of life had gotten underway probably got seriously disrupted. Um, it's possible that this late heavy bombardment, uh, in fact, it's likely that it also um, hit Mars and Mercury and Venus, and even conceivably uh, satellites in the outer solar system. Uh, more recently, since then, uh, occasional impacts by asteroids and comets have been, I believe, a major cause for mass extinctions, uh, punctuated equilibrium in the evolution of life, uh, the rise of new species, including ourselves. I'll get a little bit more into that in a moment. Uh, of course, very current is the question of the current threat to humanity. Of, a, of an impact. These are extremely rare, at least big ones are extremely rare, but uh, that is a, an issue of current concern that, uh, again, Dave Morrison will be amplifying on. And in the future, uh, asteroids and comets are sources for raw materials, uh, also they're tourist destinations, and I'll be getting into that. So the hazard from asteroids and comets. 
the Earth encounters all kinds of things, ranging from rocks that poke holes in roofs. That the, these are roof shingles here. Here's Meteor Crater in Arizona, and here's the kind of thing that we hope we don't witness. Uh, for, uh, in any case, this is actually a newly recognized threat. Um, it's hard to find more than occasional references prior to the 1970s when several science fiction books talked about the, uh, these dangers. Uh, I mean, there were, of course, fears about Halley's Comet back in 1910 and so on. And of course, it was the uh, exploration of other planets, the moon, the ubiquity of craters on the surfaces of solid surface, uh, surface objects, uh, and as well as uh, the exploration of Meteor Crater by Gene Shoemaker and his colleagues in the 50s and 60s that uh, kind of shaped our perspective that there's a lot of things out there that might uh, that, that have been crashing into planetary surfaces. It was in the 1980s that we had the Alvarez et al. Uh, hypothesis uh, for the Cretaceous tertiary boundary and the discovery of the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, in, the, in the 1990s, uh, the Space Guard survey, telescopic survey for near-Earth asteroids uh, got really underway, and there were a variety of uh, uh, pop, uh, popular accounts in newspapers and, and uh, science documentaries and TV and so on. This is an example of a natural disaster uh, with tiny chances of happening but huge consequences uh, if a large impact were to happen. And it's hard to think about this rationally and yet it uh, needs to be addressed by policy makers in some fashion. So far it's kind of just been out there and hasn't really uh, resulted in any agency taking responsibility for it or anything else like that. So what do we know about the impact hazard? We know some things very well and some things very poorly and some things intermediately. Uh, how many asteroids and comets there are, we're getting a really good handle on how many there are of various sizes and hence how often they, they strike. And how much energy is delivered by impact um, is, is just one half mv squared. So that we know, but how much uh, how much uh, environmental consequence there is to an impact, we know less well. Uh, there are studies about various uh, repercussions, which I'll, I'll get into uh, briefly. Um, e less well known, um, even than the environmental consequences, is, is the response of the, of the bias to such environmental shocks. Uh, agriculture, forests, uh, ocean life, and so on. Uh, there's really been no real study uh, about that except in the context of uh, looking back at the, at the uh, 65 million year ago KT boundary impact. And of course, it's just really difficult to understand how human beings and society and uh, politics and, the, and uh, uh, economies w would respond to a disaster that exceeds the biggest disaster that we've ever ever uh, experienced as a human species. Now this is a tech uh, technical diagram here, a log-log plot of the size distribution of, of near-Earth asteroids ranging from things uh, th th this lowest scale here, this is a logarithmic scale from a few in size up to 15 or 20 uh, kilometers in size, so it spans an enormous range of sizes. And this is the, uh, well, here is the uh, impact interval <laughs> on the Earth, again spanning vast uh, orders and orders of magnitude from those that, uh, you know, a few meters in size that hit every year to uh, those like the uh, KT boundary impactor that probably hit every hundred million years or so. And it's uh, one half mv squared involves velocity squared, so you might think the velocity be, would be important, but actually the velocity, velocities of uh, asteroids and comets striking don't vary all that much. And it's really the difference in mass uh, that really uh, is the uh, critical factor that determines 
have the consequences are from an impact. Now this is a, a diagram or a picture that I've sh often shown in which, which you read clockwise starting from here from the smallest most frequent impacts to the uh, very rare but huge ones. Uh, I, I've listed here this, this kind of uh, projectile ranging from dust to boulder to building size to mountain size to 15 kilometers. Uh, in the blue letters you see how often something like this hits from seconds to 100 million years and here are some pictures of meteors that burn up in the night sky here's a car just who's dented by the Peekskill meteorite in the 1990s uh, here we have uh, Tunguska this region uh, in in Siberia that was struck about a, a century ago uh, flattening a forest here we have um, the uh, Shoemaker Levy 9 comet impacts on Jupiter at about the same energy as, uh, say, a one or two kilometer asteroid striking the uh, Earth, which would be a civilization threatening event if it were to happen. What kinds of environmental consequences are there from these impacts? Uh, the big ones, the civilization threatening uh, size here. You have total destruction, of course, in the crater zone. You've got tsunami if uh, it strikes. Uh, the original uh, Alvarez hypothesis was uh, that whether it strikes actually in the ocean or, or on land, it uh, throws up enough uh, gunk into the uh, atmosphere to obscure the sun and bring about a global uh, climate change that would threaten agriculture worldwide. Uh, you have uh, spontaneous uh, fires uh, generated uh, more or less immediately uh, from the uh, flaming and the aftermath of the uh, cratering event uh, and then the rain raining down through the atmosphere of all the debris launched away from the uh, from the crater broiling the surface of the earth uh, you have poisoning of the biosphere here's a picture of the ozone hole the ozone layer would be completely destroyed by such an impact uh, earthquakes actually would happen as well but they'd be kind of the least of uh, all of this panoply of disease that would all be unleashed. Now here's a smaller uh, uh, kinds of things that would happen uh, from a smaller impact into land. Uh, I don't want to go through all these numbers but you know you've got uh, the, 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 the crater uh, right at ground zero but then the explosion fireball would burn you know burn people and buildings and trees and so on uh, to great much greater distances. You've got air blasts, uh, destroying structures and so on, falling debris. The ozone layer uh, is probably destroyed by objects uh, greater than 500 meters in, in diameter. And that's, that's a, a global destruction of the ozone layer that's uh, been simulated by some people who know about that. Atmospheric pollution, uh, you know, you might have an impact uh, for a sufficiently large um, asteroid. A question that's not been studied much is uh, electromagnetic pulse. Um, this would be a very bad time to have the power grid go down and, uh, and you lose all communications, uh, but that, that's a distinct uh, possibility that needs more research. Now, impacts into the ocean have a somewhat different effect. Uh, these are simulations by Steve Ward of tsunamis generated 300 meter, actually the actual asteroid Apophis, um, which uh, has a very tiny chance, one in 45,000 of striking the Earth on the 13th of April 2036. Uh, and this is one of the places it might strike, and if it did, uh, this shows the evolution of the tsunami uh, during the course of the first hour. Um, how much damage this does, of course it depends on whether there's warning or not, but uh, it depends on the, uh, off, on the offshore topography, uh, also the modeling of how much dissipation there is from these kinds of uh, short wavelength tsunami is, is not fully understood. Um, but it's possible that within minutes to hours there would be major destruction possible within kilometers of the coastline of an entire ocean with uh, the general magnitude of destruction being comparable to that of the December 2004.
Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, thinking a little bit about these consequences, um, one is that what actually happens as a result of an impact isn't, isn't really strange or, we or weird. There's no uh, uh, radioactivity. It's the same kinds of things that uh, often don't happen all, all at once together, but which uh, disaster responders uh, are used to. Fire, wind, falling debris, seismic shaking, and so on. Uh, very important is whether there's warning or not. And we've got telescopes searching for these asteroids and uh, for things uh, a half a kilometer in size and so on, there's a fair chance that we would have warning and there's a fair chance that the first thing we would know is w when the thing struck. Uh, obviously, deaths and injur injuries are dramatically reduced if there is warning. Uh, property damage can be lessened somewhat, depends on how much warning, but the warning time could really be decades. Even with no warning, human beings could reduce their exposure uh, by taking cover. Uh, they might have seconds or minutes. If you see a giant flash of light over the horizon, you actually probably have good, good t uh, enough time to get into your um, tornado shelter. Um, but people have to have been educated to recognize what's happening. Uh, think about the Indian Ocean tsunami, where there hadn't been a big tsunami uh, for generations and the water receded and people ran out uh, to catch the flopping fish and so on and uh, they didn't recognize what was happening. So I don't know if people really would recognize uh, an impact over the horizon or not and save themselves. Another issue is local versus local or regional versus global. Um, it turns out that impacts cause damages equivalent to those of major earthquakes or hurricanes like uh, but with about 1% the frequency of these other natural disasters for the same magnitude of destruction. Um, of course, if they're local or regional, uh, unaffected cities or nations uh, rush in to help, as, as happened in the case of the Indian Ocean tsunami, and hasn't happened quite so well in New Orleans and so on. Um, but of course, if, if the consequences are global, there's no one left to come and help. Everyone is suffering, and that's a uh, kind of consequence that we've not really had to face, uh, at least since maybe the plague in, uh, when was it, the 14th or 13th century? A few other consequences for, from smaller impacts, th those that do not cause these regional catastrophes. Um, the time average mortality from near-Earth asteroid impacts is similar to that from terrorism. Uh, and, and by I'm referring to terrorism not in, not in the Mideast, but uh, world terrorism over the last century. Um, uh, it goes up and down. Turns out that uh, September 11th really didn't change, change the mortality from terrorism uh, by a whole lot, because there's been terrorism not so widely appreciated for quite a long time. Um, just uh, as the public in, in the United States in particular sort of overreacted to 9-11 uh, in, in my view. The same number of people died in 9-11 uh, in September of 2001 on the highways of the United States and automobile accidents as died in the World Trade Center. You, one can imagine that an uh, impact by an asteroid being a rare, weird, uh, horrible thing could, uh, have, uh, could generate uh, overreaction as well. Small impacts uh, have happened that at least people have that um, you know they could be mistaken for an atomic attack uh, causing a dangerous response. And even sensational journalism or a mistaken prediction by astronomers uh, can cause people to uh, run into the streets and, uh, and react ir irrationally. So even the very smallest, even non-events can have some mild repercussions. So how important is this threat? Um, there's many things to worry about. You know, I show cigarettes and lightning and a shark and 9-11 and the Iraq war and automobile accident. Here, uh, John Pike, um, uh, a decade or so ago, uh, presented this pie diagram of mortality from 20th century catastrophes. And uh, as you see, it's disproportionately things like war, epidemic, famines, uh, natural hazards uh, are really rather 
diffraction and any O impacts are kind of like this little sliver due to vol volcanoes. So it's really not very big in the scheme of things. Here's a diagram that Dave Morrison and I uh, published uh, 13 years ago that I've updated a, a little bit showing the chances of dying from selected causes in the United States ranging from motor vehicle accident where your chances of dying are about one in a hundred uh, down to uh, drinking water with the EPA limit of, uh, of TCE. Um, the asteroid impact hazard when we did this uh, fell in this range with this being the lower limit and this being the upper limit of great uncertainty, especially in the mortality from the uh, multi-kilometer size asteroids. Now we've been finding a lot of these asteroids and realize they're not going to hit, and so actually the risk reduced to, uh, to kind of this range here. But still, it's in the same, uh, same range as things that people really do worry about, like terrorism, or, or airplane crashes, or other kinds of things, even if they're not uh, the, the big killers like, like these kinds of accidents or, or diseases or famine. We've been trying to uh, explain to the public how seriously to take um, uh, predictions of a future impact and uh, devise this scale called the Torino scale. It's a color-coded scale. Uh, the words in here describe how serious or not serious it is, uh, a, a threatened impact. And the, this was designed with a ped pedagogic purpose of uh, having almost all threatened uh, impacts by discovered NEOs uh, falling in the zero to one category. We had a remarkable event where suddenly it went, we, had a, we had a four uh, the week just before the Indian Ocean tsunami. And that sends some of us back scratching our heads as to what's going on. Uh, these kind of scale, here it is in miniature, I just, all kinds of uh, scientists and uh, disaster planners and so on try to uh, communicate with the public by these scales. Uh, I'm not sure how successful it is. You might recognize this scale here. I mean, we still wrestle in airports today with uh, the orange color for the terrorism scale, and uh, this has not been, the scale has not been widely uh, appreciated except by Jay Leno and people like that. Um, anyway, uh, Wrapping up my in intro here on the uh, impact hazard, uh, Dave Morrison's going to talk about how we're going to deal with these things. Uh, I just would point out that we haven't dealt very well with other kinds of natural disasters. Um, if you think about the tsunami or New Orleans and so on, uh, there's a community of people who take very seriously uh, their responsibilities for trying to uh, plan for and mitigate uh, natural disasters, but uh, there's a, a, a long way to go for disasters that are much more common than the impact hazard. Okay, now let me um, move to a counterpoint here uh, of contrasting um, asteroid comet impacts and climate change, which is uh, very much in our minds. First, I'd like to just historically mention that the uh, mass extinctions uh, in the geological record, it's been a matter of controversy as to whether, uh, it's, it's pretty well agreed except for a few holdouts that the KT boundary impact when uh, the 70 percent of species that were wiped out in the KT boundary, but uh, no smoking gun has been found for some of the older uh, large um, mass extinctions in the geological record, where of course the geological record is, is blurrier and so on. But uh, quite a few uh, geologists and paleontologists uh, say, oh, well, the KT boundary, yeah, that was an asteroid or a comet, but it was an exception that it's slowly acting processes of one sort or another that have uh, resulted in these mass extinctions. And I, I think that's just not likely to turn out to be the case because the Earth, we do believe, has been struck by roughly half a dozen uh, other impacts of the same scale as the KT boundary since the Cambrian. Uh, so those things happened and uh, boy, they sh should have had an, a, an effect. In terms of destructive energy per unit time delivered to the ether, 
there, there's just no terrestrial process that comes at all close to the liberation of 100 million megatons of TNT equivalent, you know, within two hours the entire globe is a broiling oven. Uh, there's no places for little animals to hide or fishes to swim and uh, no time to, to move to, to such a location. Um, terrestrial causes tend to operate over centuries, millions of years, uh, and very few of them are global in effect. I mean, uh, there's a few kinds of catastrophic terrestrial events that have been hypothesized, such as a catastrophic sea level rise due to uh, slippage of some large landmass or body of ice in, in, into the water. But of course, that's not global. That doesn't affect the interiors of continents, for example. It's just really hard to understand how anything else could be sudden and energetic as an impact. I'm going to say more about suddenness because I think that's a really critical issue to think about as we uh, look at um, our lives today in the face of uh, climate change, for example. Human beings are dramatically affected by change. Uh, we already heard an introductory talk here about uh, kind of the uh, dialectic between going out and exploring and developing our natural world and using it and living on it and so on. And yet, uh, on the other hand, we, we desire to have a constancy in our life so we know what to expect uh, when the sun rises tomorrow morning and so on. When changes occur too rapidly, we become stressed. And when they occur so rapidly that we simply cannot adapt, then we consider that change to be a disaster. I've, list, I've listed a bunch of things that are happening in modern society that uh, are probably a result of what people c consider to be progress, but are clearly uh, stressful. Uh, cell phone cacophony, uh, smog, uh, rezonings, degradation of coral reefs, proliferation of advertising everywhere, the loss of the night sky. We heard about that already. Uh, the urban heat island discomforts in, a, in places like Phoenix. Disruption by building and road construction that seems to be always uh, causing us to have to deal or, or uh, hear, uh, have noise outside and so on. Um, opinions differ on what we can tolerate, and I think individual human psychologies are different. But the more rapid the changes, the less well we can adapt to them, and some rapid changes that are familiar are okay, like the sudden onset of night as the sun sets. That happens pretty rapidly. That takes about an hour to get, get dark when the sun goes down. On the other hand, if it happens because of a widespread power out, you know, it's a, it's a major disaster. So um, we do pretty poorly with rapid change. So NEO impacts and climate change. Now there's some things that are similar about these two things that I think are interesting. They're both uh, potentially, well, climate, global climate change is indeed uh, planetary in scale, and a large enough NEO impact uh, could be a global catastrophe. Uh, the other thing is that we can do something about, th about this. Uh, on the one hand, a relatively simple space mission could, in favorable cases, deflect an asteroid so it doesn't hit the Earth. Um, in the case of climate change, uh, we witness uh, all the politics and so on, but certainly in principle, society could choose to reduce greenhouse gases and cause uh, these rising temperatures to rise no, no further. Dissimilarities, however, are, are very... Um, in the, on the one hand, climate change is actually happening. Right now, as we sit here, it's a, it's a reality, and no probability about it, whereas the NEO global catastrophe is extremely unlikely to happen this century, although it, it could happen. No, uh, who knows what the state of society would be uh, hundreds of thousands of years from now, for, for example. Another major dissimilarity, though, is this issue of the time scale for major changes. Global climate change um, takes about a, a century for major, major uh, changes. Whereas, as I've already described, the global effects for a global uh, impact disaster, uh, the immediate effects happen within a couple of hours, and uh, the global climate change uh, due to the strat stratospheric pollution uh, would uh, be in place within months. In the IPCC scenario, 
A1 to B, which I'm illustrating here. This is uh, from the uh, uh, release document of uh, February. Um, you see that it, you know by the 19 by the 2020s there's modest effects, and you don't really get serious effects for many more decades beyond that. In the case of an asteroid, he, if Apophis is to hit in, on the 13th of April 2036, it's going to hit somewhere along this red line. That's a, that's a fact. Now there's uh, only one chance in 45,000 that it will, but it will be along that red line, and the damage. The local regional damage will be in a swath around this red line or along the coastlines of the ocean in, in, in which it hits. Um, th those local and regional effects will happen within minutes to hours. And if there's any, I mean, there will be global effects, probably not catastrophic though, um, uh, but those would be manifest within a matter of months. And then there's a very big difference between. Uh, decades and decades and hours and months. So I, I just wonder whether climate change actually is a global disaster. Uh, Roger Pilkey, who was going to be here at this conference, uh, has pointed out that the, inc the damages to uh, infrastructure due to climate change that have been documented are minuscule compared to uh, the damage that's done simply because human beings are placing themselves in harm's way by moving to the coastlines in particular and, and other similar uh, effects. So it's not that uh, climate change isn't happening, but other kinds of societal migrations and changes uh, have even greater effects than that. Uh, people can migrate out of Florida at the same rate that they migrated in during the 20th century um, and uh, avoid the what's what might well happen to Florida in a century or two. Many species are certainly being lost by, habita by the removal of habitat due to uh, shifting climates, especially in the polar areas. But uh, hum humanity's uh, progress and expansion and development and, and cutting down the rainforest and so on are destroying species at uh, an extremely rapid rate anyway. Here's uh, from the uh, release last week, I guess it was, of the uh, IPCC's uh, report on the uh, projected, projected actual consequences of climate change depend, uh, depending upon how much, uh, what the temperature rise in degrees C, uh, whether it's, typically it's thought that within the next uh, century it'll be in the range of two and a half to maybe five degrees uh, C. And you can read all these different negative consequences and there are things that one really worries about a whole lot. On the other hand, lots of things change on, on those kinds of timescales and have in the past century. Um, we've had uh, all kinds, I mean, we're worried a whole lot about transportation issues. Uh, uh, it's, uh, but you know, a century ago we were doing, dealing with a horse and buck, uh, buggy rather than automobiles and airplanes. Economic swings like the Great Depression happened with a great uh, impact. There's all kinds of political swings that happen on those time scales. Uh, the rise and fall of diseases happen on such time scales. In some countries, uh, I mean, the population explosion has uh, dramatically uh, engulfed, uh, you know, changed the reality of life in many countries. Other countries like China have, have uh, sharply curtailed growth. Uh, war the changes in, uh, in war and peace occur on similar time scales. And so climate change is not like the, the catastrophes that could truly threaten the future of our civilization, uh, like all out nuclear warfare or a global epidemic or, or an am impact. Um, let me just pass by that one. Uh, I was going to tell you about my visit to the Rhone Glacier back when I was a kid. It's, it's not there anymore, not, not the part I was in. <laughs> um, I want to close up here by talking a little bit about preserving asteroids and comets. Uh, for sure, we're going to be exploring and utilizing these objects. They may be the stepping stones to Mars. They certainly will be the sources of fuel, water, and shielding in, in space operations. Um, but as we mine them and explore them, 
them around, we should consider setting some aside for post posterity, I, I suggest. I, I'm, I'm not really quite sure how far one should go in this. Uh, here's uh, Bruce Dern and Silent Running, just as an example of preservation in space. Now, some, some asteroids are really special. This, this one, this is like a three-frame movie of an asteroid that uh, is actually bleeding material off of its equator between the moon and the equator. It's a near asteroid with this wonderful satellite. Here's its shadow on the, on the object. Uh, found, uh, th these are data from the Arecibo radar or by Steve Ostro and his colleagues. Uh, here on the asteroid, near Earth asteroid Eros, is a, what looks like a pond. It's not really a pond, but it has a beach like structure, and it's been really difficult to figure out what the processes are that shape, that produce such uh, fascinating geology. Here's something to comprehend here. The surface areas of asteroids is of truly planetary scale. Um, the 200 asteroids larger than 100 kilometers in diameter have a combined surface area greater than that of, of Russia, the, most, uh, the, the largest country on the planet. Asteroids larger than 4 kilometers in diameter exceed the surface area of the moon. Asteroids larger than B612, the asteroid the Little Prince lived on, I, I don't know how, quite how tall the Little Prince was, but uh, uh, larger than 2 meters, um, have a land area similar to the surface area of Mars or the total land area of the Earth. So uh, we have to think of the asteroids as uh, not just little bits of rock and, and ice, but uh, real places to, uh, to think about. Um, candidates, I would suggest, for preservation might include the first asteroids and comets that have been explored, and, and not just by spacecraft, like Gaspra, the first asteroid to be flown past by a spacecraft, but here we have this uh, totally amazing metal metallic asteroid Cleopatra revealed by radar. Uh, here we have Eugenia and its moon uh, discovered actually by the Keck telescope. Um, here's Comet Vilt 2 and there's Temple 1. Uh, these are iconic uh, uh, pictures and very special events in the history of space exploration, and uh, I wouldn't really like to see, you know, built tube blown up so that you can't see it any longer, or tracks all over M Matilda. Um, other small bodies have unique scientific or historical interests. I point out Vesta. Vesta is uh, totally unique in the in the solar system, um, being a, a, a basalt covered large, large body. Uh, the meteorites that we get from Vesta actually were the, uh, have formed the baseline for planetary cr chronology since the uh, Apollo program. Uh, it's uh, a very special place. Uh, Comet Halle was depicted in the Bayou Tapestry with William the Conqueror and uh, has uh, played a hi uh, historic role throughout millennia. Um, uh, I think we might want to leave that one alone unless it's going to run into us, which it won't for a very long time. So kind of to conclude here, asteroids are not likely to destroy our world. They're extremely unlikely to do so in you know, lifetimes of ourselves or our grandkids or anything that is at all in, in our foreseeable future. But I, I, I hope that my discussion here has stimulated a little thought about how to put uh, extreme environmental disasters uh, uh, in, into context with the more likely ones that we're wrestling with, uh, to help us to distinguish between social issues and true catastrophes. Uh, there's many, many threats to our society and our lives that are, right, uh, that are here right, uh, right now instead of being very small probabilities of happening. Uh, and asteroids are in our future as places to travel to and as fuel stations for a spacefaring civilization. And that, that's my comments, and I'd be glad to participate in the discussion. Sure. Okay. Do you have any questions? Questions, comments? Yeah, yes, John. A very interesting distinction between uh, John Lewis, yeah. between uh, the tension between constancy and change and how that impacts people. There is a mythology out there which I call the
world, which is that everything was constant and perfect until human beings came along. <laughs> you want to comment on that? Well, the, uh, we can tell we can tell from the geology and so on that the Earth has always been changing, and our familiar continents weren't there, and and so on. That's that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how much you could comment on this, but you could, and, and many people have obviously, that um, a focus on asteroids is entirely a more pragmatic, uh, could be an entirely more pragmatic central focus for our space program than, say, the moon, um, in the sense that these things can come and hit us, you know, <laughs> you know, for, for among other ob reasons, but you know. And um, I don't know, can you comment on that? I, I obviously know a bit about it, but I think it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on, on you know, the sort of historical reasons why uh, this hasn't been a focus of our space program. Well, I think uh, early on, um, the, the small is beautiful uh, concept hadn't really developed. We thought of the solar system as being made up of planets. And, uh, you know, you even hear little bits of this today as uh, it's suggested by some commentators that uh, the demotion of Pluto is a planet. Uh, I mean, I actually heard this on, I think, Marketplace, the, the public radio uh, economics program. They said, well, gee, maybe NASA's uh, not going to go ahead with the New Horizons mission now that Pluto isn't a planet, you know, uh, which is nuts. It was already launched at the time, but... Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that was the beginning, is just the things that are small um, just uh, sometimes aren't, aren't valued so much, although there's been some uh, some change in that attitude. Uh, as we've seen these things, they're just totally remarkable looking things and people have gotten more fascinated. Uh, they are uh, especially useful. Um, you know, it takes some energy to get down on, uh, on the surface of the moon and to lift things off the surface of the moon and there are a number of near-Earth asteroids and more being discovered all the time that Bill Gates is singing at me here. Or so, or so. The, um, it, the, the, some near-Earth asteroids are just extremely easy to get to, and that's where you would be most cheaply and economically you'd go to to harvest materials for, you know, f uh, for use. Um, it, it, lately, the space program has been under great, great pressures to, uh, to fund what's already being funded and there's not really uh, wedges for, for, for new, new approaches. There, there are studies underway right now to perhaps send uh, astronauts to, to near-Earth asteroids uh, as uh, in conjunction with the, with the vision. Um, I don't know what's going to come of that. Those are some... I'll discuss thoughts. that a little bit in oh. my talk. Okay. Penny? Uh, Clark. Oh, Penny Boston, New Mexico Tech. Um, as, as we as a species sort of remove evolutionary challenges from our own environment, and we do that, of course, as a byproduct of civilization, you might think of uh, diverting all asteroids and cometary nuclei as the ultimate in escape from evolutionary pressures. And so, in which you can defend your home planet from every piece of space material that might impact it, you're taking a major leap in the direction of releasing humanity from all normal evolutionary pressures. And the fact that we're going in that direction as a species means that we're transcending our biotic potential. Our, our, um, we're, tra we're transcending our own biology. And it seems to me that while one might debate whether or not it's, it's desirable to do that from the point of view of um, keeping ourselves from ever changing again. It seems that, you know, what, what in, your, in your mind is the level at which we, we ought to, ethically ought to, divert large impacts from our, our uh, planet? Like, is something the size of Tunguska okay? Or is something the size of, uh, you know, Meteor Crater, for example, okay? 
where, where in your mind mm. com does this come down in terms of interfering too much or, or interfering just right? Well, I, I know Dave Morrison has, has the same question in one of his slides, but let me tell you a couple of my thoughts about that. I've tried to emphasize how extremely rare these, these impacts are. So on the long-term evolutionary scale, um, you know, m millions of years, uh, these impacts uh, have uh, repercussions, but I think we must think of the, of the impact hazard in, the, in a current context on a time scale of decades, maybe a century, but um, we, we actually don't have the techno, uh, technical knowledge of the orbits of these asteroids far beyond uh, a century to know whether they're going to hit or not, and so we wouldn't, we wouldn't move them anyway. And when you're talking about smaller, uh, more frequent impacts, um, they don't really affect evolution. They, they wipe out a farm or they wipe out a, you know, some piece of desert somewhere, and they, they really aren't important. So I, I really think that the tampering with the, the biological evolution is going to be done in the laboratories of universities and NIH and so on. <laughs> it's not really going to be whether or not we deal with, with the asteroids. That's my take. Yes. In the back there. Yes. Frodeman, yeah. Uh, Clark, Bob Frodeman. Um, you weren't at the museum last night. It's a, it's a wonderful, or maybe you were. were, were I intended to get on the webcast, but I was just, <laughs> just didn't make Boy, it. Boy, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a great comparison, and you can go, this is archived, so you could go see yeah, how okay. well my representation of Rusty Schweikert's point uh, is, how, how accurate it is. But, but boy, what a different kind of story you're telling than the one that Rusty did. Rusty <laughs> last night on the same topic was so much more deterministic, okay, in the sense that this is a clear, not immediate, but clear and omnipresent danger. That is, it, it is a cultural, in fact, a planetary imp imperative that we address this. And he's talking about putting uh, you know, a proposal, a policy proposal before the UN in order to ha come up with some kind of governing body for making decisions about this. You're painting an entirely different kind of picture about, I mean, look at the, the, the last headline you leave us with, are not likely to destroy our world within, uh, w within what, the next hundred years. Uh, so my question to you, if you could you know, adjudicate a little bit between someone who's not here to defend himself, Rusty Schweikert, <laughs> is this. The question I would oppose to him, and I want to pose to you, how deterministic are our calculations of the paths of any of these objects? That is to say, in principle, I imagine it's a fairly simple Newtonian calculation. But when you start to Take, w w when you move to the on the level of observational data to plug in, to figure out where these things are, where they're moving, how they're going to be deflected by different gravitational uh, forces as they go on through, how cl could you give us some sense of how close these things would have to get before we could really tell if they're a real problem? Well, um, the science of uh, predicting uh, orbits uh, in the complex uh, arena that we, we live in where there are things, you probably heard Rusty talk about keyholes, uh, where uh, if an asteroid is uh, within a, a region just the size of this room, it could deflect it onto a resonant return that would cause it to come back and hit the Earth, whereas if it, it passes several rooms over, it comes back months after the Earth has already passed by. Um, but the science is pretty good. It depends on the measurements. And the measurements uh, for the majority of asteroids, we don't even know that they exist, so we can't predict where they are. And of course, what makes the newspapers is when things are first discovered, the measurements do not define a very precise orbit at all, and so there's a small chance that it's going to hit, but it probably won't. But uh, with facilities like the Arecibo radar, which, by the way, is, is uh, National Science Foundation has announced it's going to be closed down uh, in the next couple of years, which is just an appalling thought. But with uh, facilities like that, uh, you can make uh, good measurements. And I think that some 
goals that were not understood a decade ago have been ironed out. And this, this line here, this is actually calculated by Rusty Schweikert. Um, and uh, it's been uh, confirmed by people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that that is where Apophis will hit if, if it does. Uh, Rusty's point um, is, a, I believe, fundamentally a psychological point, which is that um, if, if you um, are an investor in, uh, in a would-be resort in Costa Rica and and you know that there's a chance that it's going to get wiped out by an asteroid from a from a diagram like this that you know it doesn't matter really how big or small the impact is there will be a demand that people do something about it and uh, I, I don't know psychology is very hard to predict and so I, I, I don't know but uh, there, there certainly is uh, something to be said for the fact that merely knowing, I, I mean, there, there was a time uh, for a week or so just before the tsunami hit the Indian Ocean where the Jet Propulsion Lab and the Italian counterpart uh, predicted, uh, felt that there was a one chance in 37 that Apophis was going to strike the Earth in 2029. One chance in 37 of a 300 meter size object and, and it wasn't a mistake. It's just uh, the case that that happens to be where the the odds were. On, and when better observations came in, the you know one of the 38 or 36 other chances out of 37 turned out to be true, and it and it isn't going to hit. But you know, would you invest in uh, you know in something along that line? Actually, the the line for that 2029 impact went through England and Germany and. Iraq and uh, the, uh, uh, India and all kinds of popula populous places. And uh, can I follow yeah. up? Uh, you haven't answered my question. I think it's because I didn't phrase my question very no. well, and that's because I think I don't know enough in the subject to quite phrase my, okay. my concern. Uh, let, me, let me take one more stab at it. Um, I, the, the uncertainties here, you, you said the science is well understood, but the observation data is the, the question. At one point it was a 1 in 37 chance and now it's a 1 in 40, four, uh, 45,000 chance. There are error bars in that obs observational data now. I'm just wondering, even though your tone is very much not like Rusty's last night, look, uh, let's look at the slide here uh, where you said, this is a fact, and I noted that language of a few minutes ago, but isn't it best, better to say this is an interpretation of the data as best understood today, but this data is going to be refined any number of times, I mean thousands of times probably between now and April 13, 2036. Is, is, is that a proper way to understand it or not? Well, the data won't be reinterpreted so much as there will be more data. Turns out that this particular asteroid, for example, is uh, hidden, it's near the sun and you can't see it uh, and won't be able to see it again until around 2012. And then there will be more observations and it will refine the orbit uh, quite a bit. There have been very extensive studies for this particular asteroid, but it could be any other one, on uh, how much better uh, the orbit will become defined in the future uh, given certain telescopes or given, given uh, uh, radar capabilities or by putting a transponder actually on an asteroid, you can calculate what will happen. I'm not answering your question. I don't know. I can give it a try. <laughs> Go ahead. Let me try asking it again. Just to, how close would Apophis have to be for us to know when it's 100 percent? How much warning? You kept you kept saying you know we need more, warning is going to make a big difference. How much warning is it possible for us to have? Um. It, it depends on a case-by-case -case basis, but um, all, as I say, already. Just in general. Um, well, in, in, in general, you probably can figure out that it's going to hit the Earth uh, years to decades uh, in advance. And if you want to know where it's going to hit on the Earth, um, actually, if it's going to hit the Earth, you already know it's going to hit along a line like that. Where on that line it, it will hit may not be known until 
you know, months or years but out. May, may I confess that I don't believe that line at all? My guess is that that line is a deterministic answer on the basis of the data we have now, but as you just said, we'll get more data at some point and then we'll have a different line, which will also be the deterministic result of that data that we have at that point. It turns out that's not, not true. Not true. Not that, true. That, that line is uh, never going to change. Why? Uh, the, the, the asteroid will hit, you know, over there across the uh, 101 uh, on the continuation of this line in space. But if it hits the Earth, it will be on that line. And it's just simply that the errors in the errors along the line are, I don't know, 100,000 times bigger than the errors uh, uh, across the line. It's just a fact. <laughs> let, let, let me uh, um, address this issue about Rusty's uh, determinism, because I think it's a little misrepresented. Uh, what Rusty was pointing out last night is that as more telescopes come online and we get much, much better data on even the smallest objects, um, the reality of a collision with the Earth increases um, and the, even within certain uncert, un, uncertain bounds, like one in a hundred, um, decisions will have to be made. So what he was deterministic about is not that an impact will occur. His, what, what his determinism is, we will have to deal with a finite chance of a collision of some size, even perhaps a small one, in the next 15 years. I mean, that was what he said. But it wasn't that it was going to happen. It's just that, that we, we're acquiring enough data that we're going to have to deal with it one way or another. Well, we've already seen in, in this case that there was a time when the uh, probability of impact was, uh, was very large. And Rusty probably showed his diag diagram where he has a map like this crisscrossed by red lines. He didn't show the one that has 100 lines well, going. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think he probably did. And, uh, and it comes back to Penny's question about um, do you worry about a Tunguska? I mean, Tunguska uh, flattened this forest in Siberia and probably killed nobody, maybe killed a couple of people. Um, it's uh, caused by something, I don't know, comparable in size to this building I, 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 that hit and, and uh, exploded in the atmosphere. And, you know, I, I, I often show, I didn't in this talk, a, a little diagram that shows Washington, a map of Washington, D.C. with the beltway and the size of area affected in Siberia is, is roughly that. And people always think, hey, boy, wouldn't that be neat to have that hit, hit, hit there? But, uh, <laughs> uh, but the chances, of course, are that it's got three quarters of a 75% uh, chance of an ocean. And exploding 10 kilometers above the ocean is going to do nothing unless you're an extremely unlucky uh, uh, fisherman or something. And uh, most of the rest of the Earth's pop uh, Earth is not populated en enough. So the chances, even in this unlikely event of a Tunguska, which is, even though Tunguska happened just one century ago, the best estimate is that t things that of that size actually happen every uh, thousand years or two thousand years. And so the chances of it happening anywhere in the Earth is very small. And, you know, why not just evacuate people from the farmlands uh, where it might happen? It's, uh, it's not a... Uh, but, but Rusty says people will get, get frightened. And they might. I mean, you may remember when Skylab was falling. And, you know, there, there have been uh, overreactions to things falling out of the skies in the past. Uh, Margaret. Yeah, um, I find that in thinking about planetary protection, okay. we have some of the issues because planetary protection deals with microbial cross-contamination and there's a greater uncertainty. We don't even know if there is life out there and if there is, we don't know what it's like. And so when we talk about bringing things to Earth, we have to deal with unknowns, uncertainty, and unknowables. So what I've found is it's helpful to think about where we are in the debate. We have, you've got multiple debates just as we do in planetary protection. At one level, this is a science debate and you're going to find scientists on of the issue. Is it going to hit? Is it not going to hit? When's it going to hit? That's, do we have the observations? Will we get better ones? All of those are science expert questions, and you will find debate. Second level is decision making. It's what Rusty was talking about. At what point do we step in and say we need to do something? That's a kind of, that's a risk. You've, you're doing the risk assessment. Now you're talking about the risk management. What do we do about that information? At what point do we act or not act? And who decides all of that?
And the next level of it is societal implications, which is still different. That's what does the world think as a whole. And then you get ethical questions that have to do with who is going to make the decisions and are we collectively humankind in our evolutionary trajectory going to allow or not allow. So when you scientifically and risk-wise, you've got tremendous overlaps of issues and it's why you can't resolve it. In addition, when you now start to tease it apart ethically, you have different kinds of ethics. So at the first level, you have you know doing good science and sharing information. That's an ethical thing to do, responsible science. The next level, decision making, is a different set of ethical concerns. And at the larger scale, it's different ethical concerns as well. So I wonder, you know, as we try to think about how to talk to the public about it, we, we almost have to communicate those different levels. And that communication may help people understand why it looks like the scientists don't know what they're doing. You know, well, that's the, the, a whole bunch of interesting comments. So let me just. Uh, mentioned that when the first one of these paths of risk were calculated uh, for Apophis at JPL, uh, they decided that would not be released to the public. Uh, and, the, and the thing is there, and so you can also learn a lot at looking at the disaster and warning um, literature. Because if you look at, say, hurricane disasters or fire as a disaster, it's an ever-present threat. We can't predict what will happen, but we know it will happen. Likewise, hurricanes, likewise, earthquakes, likewise. And as our modeling and information gets better, people get more educated about what they can do themselves personally, what society will do, what governments will do. And the more comfortable you are with that, the more aware of and knowledgeable you are of the models and things like that, the less concern there is in this alarmist fashion. And we're just not there yet. We don't have that kind of predictability as we do for hurricanes. Have the um, you know, hurricanes have the benefit of satellites, so you can see the eye of the hurricane. And, and when now, when something doesn't hit like they predicted, people understand, oh, it's not that you were terrible, it's just like, oh, it turned away, or it didn't, we got lucky this time. So there's a different approach to it than there was in, say, the 1900s. Okay. I'm, uh, time's up, apparently, so. Right, five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, for